in here. That might be it. Big shots, more big shots. That is it. Wow. Game, set, and... Welcome to the Across the Karate Verse podcast. Whoa. Wow. That was nice. Nice. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to Across the Karateverse. I am your host, Uncle John, and we are back home from Miami. KC38, fantastic. The Battle of the Brunos, oh my gosh. Turbo knocks out Castaneda. That was very sick. And then I thought one of the most underrated fights of the night was actually Fabian versus Santos. That one had a lot of great strikes. The list goes on. All in all, the event fantastic but today we have episode four with dave coon i like to call him legal dave he is the general counsel for karate combat and we actually got to do the interview in person so looks a little different than it usually looks but it was great to sit down and talk with dave around all of the legal stuff that goes into turning a entire league into a dow and he gives some pretty uh pretty neat insight around i said insight weird he gives some pretty neat insight into the karate token and what it means in terms of governance and up only gaming so without further ado let's dive into our chit chat with legal dave and i hope you like the episode it's a it's a good one everybody welcome to episode four of across the karate verse and today we have mr david coon Yes. Who is the general counsel for Karate Combat? You're a lawyer. That's yes. That's what that means. Absolutely. But Dave is a fun lawyer. I think of myself as more than a lawyer, but I am a lawyer. Okay. So. It's a attribute. More than just a lawyer. There are a lot of attributes to you, but and lawyer is just one of them. I The flattery is always appreciated, so thank you. Yeah. I didn't say they were good attributes. Well, I that's, said that's fair. There are attributes. There are yeah. more to me than that. So as legal Dave, which is what I've been known to call you, I would like to know how you decided you wanted to be a lawyer and then how you decided you wanted to be a lawyer for karate combat. Yeah. So give me a little background. please. Yeah. yeah. So I think my path to law was similar to a lot of lawyers. It was a field that was always interesting to me. I just fell into it right after college. I became a finance lawyer. And where'd you go to college? Huh? I went to college at UPenn, University wow. of Pennsylvania, yep. went to Boston College Law. I decided to be a finance, a real estate finance lawyer. Worked about a decade, white shoe law firms in New York City. What does white shoe law firm mean? Just big law. It, big there's law? A, an acronym, big law. Right. A phrase, excuse me, big law. It's just larger law firms, like the corporate. Like big, corporations, the big wigs. Like the big legal corporations, gotcha, basically. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So really good experience. Did a lot of finance transactions. Very different, very structured. I would say it's structured finance, but answers to a lot of the questions. Most of the questions, mm. as contrasted to some of the stuff we'll talk about today. I discovered crypto. I discovered Ethereum. Um, it was very interesting to me. I how did you find it? Yeah, so I I've just been looking everywhere, yeah. and I can't. I just can't track it down. Yeah, yeah. So I think I probably my path into crypto was also somewhat conventional FOMO, effectively. FOMO, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's how I got into Bitcoin and then Ethereum. I figured out how staking worked. I decided it was very similar to some of the transactions, conceptually similar to some of the finance stuff I was doing. I was like, this could be the intersection of money and technology, you know, mm -hmm. the kind of the money on the internet. When I figured out how kind of proof of stake networks like Ethereum post-merge work, and I got into the technology, took a job as general counsel with another crypto team. I was there for 15 months. And then um, I went to college with Rob Bryan, founder of Karate Combat. He brought me on to advise on some of the legal components of the transition to Web3. And it went well, and here we are. Now I'm full-time. Downhill from there. Yeah. Staking, if I'm, I know correctly, because I have some things staked, but I just did it. I, don't, I didn't really do my homework on it. That's when you, like, you purchase the ETH and then you leave it until the network is secure and then you're able to trade. Is yeah, right? so the so way I think about it is just very high level. This is the conceptual understanding that I'm somebody like me. I'm not a technical person, but it makes sense to me is you had Bitcoin. It was revolutionary. It was a way for a decentralized group of people globally to agree right, right. on a consensus, the status of database. So the way that they did it was that the machines solve a puzzle. Right. And the machine that solves the puzzle first gets a reward. That's a Bitcoin. So Ethereum, Vitalik, and then some of these other geniuses realized you could achieve the same objective 
in a more energy friendly, eco friendly way with the proof of stake, and instead of being required to put in all of the resources and capital and time to invest in the machines that would solve the puzzle, you can own a piece of the network effectively, put that piece of network up, stake it to incentivize people to behave, to come to a consensus without trust. So the idea is just incentive mechanisms, right? So that's why I think a lot of us are very into crypto technology is it's just testing ways to incentivize people to behave in certain ways. And that's something that we're very focused on with Karate Combat is there really should be no token, no coin if there's not a reason, right, for there to be one. And we think that we have a very compelling use for the karate token to give people incentive to pay attention, to watch fights, to participate, to make a long-term investment of their time, participating in a game, in a gamified setting in which people can do things that they want to do. We want to be entertained. We want to watch combat sports. We want to watch fights. We want to care who wins, right? So we think where we're going with the Up Only Gaming application and the gamified nature of that consumption of content is an incredible incentive mechanism and it's in line with the kind of path we see for the intersection of kind of technology and money oh, we're so. going to get into that now don't Still. you worry don't you worry about that we're going to unpack that a lot more cool but as legal dave when you wake up in the morning and punch the card for karate combat what exactly are some of the things that you have to navigate especially now that the league is transitioning into a dow what sort of things are you keeping your head on a swivel for, like in the communications with the masses or like mm -hmm. just day-to-day -day stuff? Yeah, yeah. So, look, we have an incredible team of directors and trustees with invaluable resources and experience and knowledge. So really on a daily basis, a big part of what I do on the legal side is communicating with them, learning from them getting advice, giving some legal tips, but that's a huge part of it in the decision-making. And a big part of just trying to be responsible, right? From a legal perspective, we always wanna make sure that all of the disclosures are accurate. They're responsible, right? People to participate in the Up Only Gaming system. We want people to hold the coins for the right reasons. We want them to be engaged and interested in the content, a lot of the day-to-day -day kind of minutia is just picking through some of the feedback that we get from others and making sure that the things that whoever's on the front lines talking about karate combat from the perspective of the foundation is being responsible. And then obviously- Are the risks higher with everything being a DAO? And if the risks are higher, like what are some of those risks that you have sure. to be wary of? The things you have to like be sure to communicate or- Of course, or of else. course, yeah. So look, I think anyone who's been involved with the crypto project knows that one of, if not the most important things to keep in mind, obviously other than security and things of that nature are marketing. Something is being marketed. It is absolutely vital. So the, what we want to do is always make sure that people understand that coin is not a speculative investment. It is a tool that unlocks access, right, to content. It's a tool that unlocks access to real world experiences, right? We have real fight events all over the world, right? We have an open IP ecosystem, which we're very excited about, right? Giving third party developers incentive and a way to build applications with Karate Combat's IP, right? We've had an extremely permissive perspective on IP since day one. All of our fights are streamed globally for free on the internet on karate.com and the YouTube channel. Like I said, like what I led with was there's no real reason to have a token, right? Unless there's a real reason to have a token. Right. There, we wouldn't be having this discussion if there wasn't an incredible application where people can actually use the token to vote for their favorite fighters. By voting for their favorite fighters, they increase prize pools to give incentive to the fighters, right? To grow their fan base, to win the fights, to give incentive to the fans, to watch the fights, to vote for their favorite fighters. We feel very strongly that there's unprecedented day one utility for the karate token. So we need to make sure that we're doing our job of communicating that to whomever needs to hear it. Yeah, every time you say the reason, I think of Hoobah Stank. <laughs> I love that song. Yeah, dude, same. <laughs> I've done a karaoke version of that song from time to time. So. No way. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a self-titled karaoke king. Okay. Yeah. It's one of my spiritual gifts. So if people start talking about karaoke, I'm usually, my heart rate goes up pretty quickly. We've got a new objective is yeah. we're going to go to a karaoke All I'm uh, saying is establishment together. karaoke might need to be happening here pretty soon. Okay. I feel like that was a good answer to the risk question. 
Okay. By the way, I did my best. Got Thanks lost in the answer there a little bit, but I think we came full. Sorry, right, that's what our editor's for. Hey, everybody! Shout out to our editor, Mr. Willem Dafoe. Onward, then. Yep. There are certain things you have to piece together and make sure the marketing does well. I guess you work pretty in tandem with the marketing team. Is it big? The marketing team? Though? Small. I mean, the Web three team is small at the moment. So historically, right? There have been. This is Casey. We're on location now, filming KC thirty eight tonight. Oh yeah. It's so, happening in how many hours is it? Four hours. I'm going to need to squeeze in a little nappy nap before it happens. I think I, I need some shut-eye too. Yeah. But there is a team that's did promotions and marketing for okay, the league so they itself. basically so, just oversee what they're doing. They do sure. what they do. They do a great job. Then we've got some Web3 contributors specific to content for Web3. Yeah, like we, you know, we definitely collaborate and work closely and again solicit advice from our incredible directors and trustees who've been through this drill. Numerous times. Yeah, we collaborate. We like to be collaborative. Drop some collabs. We do some collabing. Do some collabing. That's it. So a lot of the people that I'm speaking with or have given feedback on this podcast talk through various different questions, but then somebody who may not know as much about Web3, but knows a lot either about fighting or has just heard in general like about the crypto market. One of the things the crypto market is the most notorious for is people who like buy low, sell high, and are making money off these projects and something I guess I haven't gotten like straight answers on. And I guess for good reasons, because you have to be concerned about like talking about things in a speculative way, but is there actual like financial value attached to these tokens that if a holder of the tokens chose, they could cash in or cash out wherever the value of them might be. If there's value, not that they would make money or lose money, just, Trying to keep it vague. Yeah, Am no, I doing so, a good legal job of keeping it vague? Yeah, I think that the first thing to note is that tokens are really like a customer acquisition strategy. And I think that's where a lot of people, there is, seems to be a consensus that it's an incredible marketing tool, maybe one of the best marketing tools uh, that we have at our disposal, right, is to give free airdrops to people to encourage them to care about Karate Combat. Our primary customer acquisition strategy is giving out free airdrops, right? So we don't sell. And an airdrop, for those that don't know, is quite literally what it sounds like you are you have a wallet set up and this karate token is then airdropped into your wallet so you are now the owner of these tokens yeah so we don't so we're not selling tokens to end users we're giving them away for free so that's one of the revolutionary components of the league strategy is to basically give away half the league for free over time in order to achieve the objective of getting a distributed huge global distributed network of fans right with the token strategy, there needs to be a market for the tokens, right? It's supply and demand, tokens have a price, right? But like I said, our objective is to distribute the tokens as a mechanism to grow the network. That's what we do. We'll always be a market price on the token. You can go presumably to a centralized exchange, purchase a token. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. I guess I would hope that as people learn about what the karate token is actually doing for sports, as a whole, like beyond just the Karate Combat League, the reason to own these tokens is the reason is not just you. That was a Hoobastank reference. I tried to throw it in there. Hoobastank, come to KC39. I'll get you tickets. Uh, we'll see you there. Yeah, we'll see you there, dude. The reason to hold these tokens goes far beyond any financial upside. Talk about then, for me, David, beyond just this possible financial upside, there's also a possible financial downside. You can't hedge your bets. This isn't financial advice. This is... Yeah, yeah. So so the what we envision is an open IP ecosystem where we have a lot of different projects. We already have a number of projects. Krause House is, is obviously hosting the podcast series, which is incredible. What we envision for the token is not just a, the up only gaming kind of active engagement for each fight. It's not only governance, right? For we'll start with governance decisions. We think people care about that for, based on the feedback we've gotten from the community to date. It seems that people care about selecting which fighters potentially fight matchups and which fighters get contracts, right? So those are like the areas which we're the most focused on from the DAO's perspective of governance. So between the up only gaming utility, between the governance utility that we're super excited about and the open IP ecosystem where we will encourage and do everything we can to facilitate third-party developers coming in and building cool things. And we will encourage them to create additional utility for the tokens, right? Figure out a way to incorporate them into the project, whether it's a, a project 
there's a project called Zoop Cards, who's going to put out like a top type. Oh, no way. You know yeah. all the baseball cards. So that, yeah, yeah, that's totally. interesting. To like me. a product on the Hedera network. Okay. And based on preliminary discussions, they're looking into taking karate tokens, to accepting karate tokens on their platform. Again, like the token itself, I think between the up only gaming, between the governance, right, the actual real voting abilities, specifically about things people care about, and then we'll expand that over time into as many different areas as token holders are interested in within the constraints, the legal kind of the guidelines we put out at the beginning. Between all of these different paths and all these different avenues for use of the token, like we think it's basically unprecedented, the amount of real world use for the tokens day one. Yeah, there are plenty of crypto projects that don't really have their foot in like the real world like a lot of the utility is online or through like online clubs maybe like a discount here and there for like different stores but really think the way that sports are headed is by viewing fans as something more than just being in attendance to an event what i'm really excited personally about karate combat doing is yes of course there's the karate tokens attachment to a market that has monetary value but then beyond that, like this is a chance to have ownership like utility of a token and be involved in a league in the same way that somebody who like works for the league would. Like yeah. being able to contribute to the betterment of the league and to use the tokens that you hold and that you can win from up only gaming, those tokens don't just sit around. Like those tokens are used as like a are they weighted for the governance for voting? Do you vote? Your number of tokens that you own, you can put towards. Yeah, that, like that that'll be how it works. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So like if you win a bunch of tokens and you really want to see one fighter, then like your tokens you own will have a lot of weight and you can have a real possible impact in the way that the league runs beyond just yeah. what's already there. Which I think cool. that's, yeah, that's important to note. I think that the, the, there's no separate equity bucket, right? Definitely all in, right, on the league. The league's really ownerless, right? Everybody who holds a token should feel some sense of ownership over the experience. And that's the goal, right? The goal is to make people feel a part of something. And that's, we're going to do everything we can to encourage the types of collaboration, build on the foundation that other projects have really, the. Like, we're not reinventing the wheel. We're reusing a lot of the strategies that, that other really smart people have used in a super exciting context of a sports league. So it's the intersection of the entertainment and the engagement of sports and these kind of lessons that we're learning from experimenting in this new world of tokens, which is super exciting. It's beyond even making like fans feel as if they're a part of something. The reality of the situation is that they are, in fact, a part of this league. Totally. Yeah. Um, there, it should be like the kind of take home, like if you remember one thing, if you listen to this podcast, it's like y there should be access, right? Like access is what we think is like the key to the future of sports engagement, right? So it's not a big secret. Younger fans and mobile streaming are disrupting pro sports. And it's a big part of this is people having access. Like you said, if somebody has something to contribute to karate combat, there should be a way for them to contribute. If it's a podcaster, if it's, you know, somebody else with other strengths, like there should always be a way to contribute in some way to what, to the ecosystem. So yeah, access is super important. Yeah. I'm excited about the fight tonight. Me too. I'm excited about the airdrop. When is the airdrop? May 10th. May 10th. There's a date. May 10th. Yeah. Save the date, everybody. 10 days before the event at the Bitcoin Miami conference Whoa. in Miami. Oh, shoot. I didn't yeah, realize yeah. that was going to be at the same time. Is that downtown? Yeah, I think so. Okay. It's at the convention center. Nice. Dude, I've never been to a Bitcoin conference. I've heard about them. I've heard they have good entertainment during these events. Yeah, I think that's right. Did you go to the last one? I did not go last year. Dang. I did not go. So Nice, dude. Thanks for being here, man. I, Absolutely. I appreciate the insight. I hope the legal stuff is not boring to me. <laughs> I, and I don't think it's boring to other people. I think parsing it down into like understandable bits is like what makes it cool you know where to find me yeah dude if you yeah. have any more questions you know where to find me where do they find you what's your twitter uh it's a great day for this so great day maybe for what you can put it in the podcast notes what's it a great day for it's ambiguous it's just this it's this yeah. nice what how do you spell it gr the number eight day d-a-y the number four this i made it super simple dude uh, intentionally so that's the silliest <laughs> great day for, that sounds it doesn't sound like a it sounds like a twitter account that you it, like you know how sometimes they have those youtube channels that feature like 
puppies <laughs> and like inspirational like animal stories. Great day for this seems yeah. like some sort of page. It's basically, where you would cats. See. It's all cats, dude. So. I hope you're not that guy. If you like, if you follow cat, him, yeah. you put pictures of your cat up. I don't, but I'm thinking about it now. Don't so for yeah. all of us. There's too many <laughs> cats on the internet. All right, so you can find Dave there on Twitter, or and we have Instagram and Twitter too. So you can find the Karate Combat Pod at Across the Karate Verse on Instagram, and then Twitter is Karate Verse Pod because Across the Karate Verse was too long, and they wouldn't let me. Understood. They wouldn't let me do it, so yeah. it's a bummer. But cool, Casey. Next time, I guess when you listeners are hearing this, the results of Casey thirty eight will have happened. So we'll be on to thirty nine. We'll be on to thirty nine. But yeah, thanks for being here, bro. Awesome, awesome. We'll do it again. Yeah. All right. Cheers. Cheers.